Hi students, welcome to week 7 and this is one of the weeks where we're going to begin a two-week study of the history of Japan. So as usual with this class we're going to be moving very quickly but I hope to be able to show you kind of the framework of the history of this region, kind of uh, its own separate culture. The history of Asia dominated by the histories of India and China. They are the two most influential cultures uh, but Japan remains uh, significantly distinct from uh, both Chinese and Indian influence. And so we're going to begin with the study of ancient and classical Japan. And we're going to start, as we always do, with the prehistoric Paleolithic period. It's a period of history when we don't have any written records or pottery evidence to tell us or to give us a sense of what these very earliest Japanese societies valued and, and desired. Um, but we can use stone tools, biological remains that have survived to give us a sense of where these societies came from. Um, the first Paleolithic discoveries uh, in Japan were made after World War II, and they're pretty limited. Um, relatively few tools have survived, there are relatively few sites that have survived. Um, that seems to be largely uh, due to the acidity of the Japanese soil, uh, which means that it's difficult for remains to survive, or more difficult than in other areas. And also because we imagine that most of the early Japanese settlements were on the seashore and during periods when sea levels were lower, and that as the sea levels rose, these settlements uh, have been lost. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see archaeological uh, digs and excavations off the coast of Japan, see if we can find some more Paleolithic remains there. Um, but of course, this is uh, extremely expensive. Uh, Japanese Paleolithic finds are so rare that in 2000, an archaeologist was even caught fabricating Paleolithic uh, remains. Um, so they're certainly seen as, as the sort of remains that you might be able to get away with fabricating because there are so few of them. Uh, so it was, it was a little difficult to be convinced or to be certain that, that these really were fake. One unique aspect of pa the Paleolithic period in Japanese history is that these finds contain some of the oldest sets of polished stones in the world. Um, and uh, typically polished stones we associate with the Neolithic period. Uh, refer, Neolithic refers to new stone tools. Uh, this is typically the period when we find civilizations uh, polishing stones into more refined tools. What's interesting is that we find Japanese societies following these kind of Neolithic technological practices, but without having made the shift from a nomadic life to an agricultural life that we associate with the Neolithic uh, revolution. Um, and so these uh, show early advances in Japanese society, early advances in the area of technology without the advances in agriculture. The best we can tell from our study of the skeletons that we found in Japan from this period, so this is what we call paleoanthropology, is that Japan was probably connected to China in some way through various land bridges when sea levels were lower. Uh, the dental structures, the other aspects of the skeletons that we find suggest that the very earliest people to live in Japan come from uh, southern Asia and from China. And so this is uh, the Paleolithic period. Now we enter an important period in the ancient history of Japan called the Jomon period. Uh, this is one of uh, the key terms that we're looking at this week. Uh, the Jomon period is really interesting because it's a period uh, when you have a hunter-gatherer society in Japan. So the Japanese are still uh, not living as farmers. They haven't made that Neolithic uh, revolution. Uh, but they also achieve a high degree of cultural sophistication and a certain degree of sedentary life. Um, and so it's a hunter-gatherer society, but it's a very sophisticated hunter-gatherer society. And we see this one uh, example of this is the pottery remains uh, that we have. And we have early Japanese pottery sites such as Kami Kuroiwa and uh, also Fukui Cave. Uh, typically, we associate pottery with a society that's already made the Neolithic Revolution. It's already made this tra this transformation from nomadic life to sedentary life. And once you have sedentary life, you develop a potter's wheel, you develop uh, the use of pottery, we have pottery remains, they're a sign of uh, a Neolithic society, a post-Neolithic society. Um, and uh, this doesn't seem to be true of the Japanese for a, a couple of reasons. Firstly, that Japan remains so fertile that uh, 
the culture and the level of sophistication in the culture is becoming more sophisticated without requiring the switch to agriculture and uh, the sort of space to develop a culture that that requires in most societies throughout the world. And second, that pottery was invented in mainland Asia and then introduced into Japan. And so the earliest bowls that we have are a little bit smaller. I think they were probably used for boiling food uh, before eating it. So smaller bowls made by a nomadic society, but that they have time to do that. So they are still uh, somewhat sedentary, even though they're still living as hunters and gatherers, because uh, the region that they're living in is so fertile. Um, the German period is divided into three sub-periods. Uh, the early German, we think, originated as a mix of uh, Siberian hunter-gatherers and uh, peoples who had migrated from China and Southeast Asia. So Paleolithic Japanese, we think, come from the south and from the east, from China and Southeast Asia. The German period is the sort of the catalyst for the German period, this more sophisticated hunter-gatherer society, is the migration of hunter-gatherers from Siberia, so from the north. Around 10,000 BC, melting ice glaciers separate Japan from mainland Asia. So we'd have these land bridges uh, that enable peoples from Southeast Asia, from China, and now from Siberia to make the passage into Japan. It's during the Jomon period that the sea levels rise and these land bridges no longer exist. And so now Japan is going to become separated and distinct from the rest of Asia. That's going to be a characteristic of uh, much of the rest of Japanese history. Um, we've looked at one of the themes of this course is how a society interacts with outsiders. We're going to see that Japanese culture is going to be, I think it's fair to say, significantly more independent and resistant to outside influence than Indian or Southeast Asian cultures that we've looked at so far. The rising temperatures, the death of the of the glaciers, and the isolating of Japan from the rest of Asia also increased the fertility of Japan. It's a pretty fertile area anyway. And so now we start to find that the forests provide substantial sources of food. Uh, there are substantial sources of fish in the ocean, for another important uh, source of food. And we have evidence of the German uh, still hunting for deer and hunting wild boar. And so there's a dramatic increase in, in population. Even though the German are still theoretically hunter-gatherers, uh, we start to see the beginnings of agriculture. And even without that agriculture, the population of Japan is increasing during this period. Middle German period comes after this increase in population and this separation of Japan from mainland Asia around 3500. Uh, we see that the pottery is starting to become more refined, uh, the beads and other forms of jewelry are becoming more common. Uh, pit houses, like you see here, uh, these are houses in which you have uh, stone floors that are sunken into the ground, and then you only have to build a smaller roof structure to go over the top of them. And you can see that now we're starting to see that uh, the pottery is becoming a little more sophisticated. Lastly, we come to the late Jomon period. The late Jomon period is from about 2500 to about 500. And so this is the point where the climate cools. So I'm just going to give you a brief climate history of the BC era here and then relate it back to Japan. Uh, we have uh, a Paleolithic age, a sort of immediate post-Ice Age period uh, when um, everywhere is very fertile. We see this in Paleolithic Japan and also in the period of the early Jomon. The middle and late Jomon is when we start to see the end of the warming period that has brought an end to the Ice Age. And typically across the world, we see cultures turning towards farming and agriculture and more intentional cultivation of their food supplies that's required as the earth is becoming less fertile. This is also true for Japan in the period of the late Jomon. Uh, the population appears to shrink, the climate appears to cool, and this is the period where farming uh, becomes established. Um, uh, in particular, we see uh, there's a Korean agricultural influence that drives the transition of the German from being a complex hunter-gatherer society to a predominantly agricultural society. <laughs>
And we see this transition more so in the Yayoi period that follows the Lake Jong. Now, when we look at skeletons from this period, the Yayoi seem to be taller, they seem to be more slender uh, than the Jong. So a new population has made its way into Japan at this time. It's during this period that Japan completes the transition from a hunter-gatherer society to being a fully sedentary and agricultural society. So now people are predominantly making their own food rather than hunting for food. And we think that the Yayoi are probably from modern-day China. They migrate, they bring these agricultural practices with them. Um, and this migration kind of overwhelmed and changed the practices of the Jomon, who were having to face the reality of needing to make a change anyway because of the, um, because of the cooling climate, the loss of fertility in the soil. It's certainly the case that we see a renewed Chinese influence during this period. Uh, we see uh, ceremonial belts and mirrors and weapons um, that show a Chinese influence, that show uh, the Japanese are learning how to manipulate bronze as a result of interaction with the Chinese. Chinese sources tell us that the Japanese lived in small, scattered tribal villages built at the top of the hill. And what you see here is the reconstruction of a Yayoi village, the historic reconstruction of a Yayoi village. Um, these villages were built on the top of the hill, and the inhabitants lived on raw fish, and vegetables, and rice. And when uh, questioned, claimed to be descended from legendary Chinese ancestors. So here, here's uh, a distinction the Yayoi and the Japanese mainstream Japanese culture at this time claims descendants from China. As the population increased, the society becomes more complex. By the time we get to the first century, the Yayoi were using iron tools and weapons. They began to manufacture textiles. They began to live in more permanent farming villages uh, of more per composed of more permanent stone buildings uh, than wooden buildings. So this transition to an agricultural society is being completed during this period. At the same time, we see increased social stratification. Um, as a society becomes more wealthy, there's more distinction between those who are wealthy and those who are less wealthy and those who are not wealthy at all. And we certainly see this with the Yayoi, where we start to see evidence that certain land, hold, land owners hold more land than others. Land and the ability and land that it's possible to cultivate, these are the most typical symbols or indications of wealth in this society. During the next period, the Kofun period, um, which sort of overlaps with the end of the Yayoi period and moves us forward to about 500 AD. Um, what's significant about the Kofun period is that it's during this time uh, that Japan becomes unified into a single kingdom. So we've gone from um, Paleolithic remains to Jomon sophisticated hunter-gatherers to a Yayoi agricultural society that becomes more sophisticated and now we're seeing uh, a unified kingdom. So if we're looking at the history of the government of Japan, you can kind of trace this developing sophistication here. Now, the symbol of the growing power of the Japanese leaders was Kofun burial mounds they constructed. Uh, the most famous of these, which you can see uh, here, is the Daisenko Kofun, uh, which was over a thousand feet long and was built over 15 years. So the Kofun mounds are basically the equivalent of the, of the Egyptian pyramids in uh, Japanese culture. Um, and the uh, Kofun achieved the unification of uh, Japan, and this is pretty commonly accepted uh, that you have five generations of Kofun rulers in this dynasty, uh, and this period marks the end of ancient Japanese history, and uh, in the next video we're going to look at classical Japanese history.